Welcome to episode 38, Construction Nation. This is Sue Dyer, your host of Construction Dream Team, where I interview industry leaders and experts so you can learn about the people side of construction and build your construction dream team based on OPE, other people's experiences, so that you don't have to suffer through and learn the hard way. We have people who've already been there. They've done that, and now you can learn from them. I am very stoked today so that we can have a great opportunity to get to know each other on LinkedIn Connecting. I have been so happy to have so many of you connecting and talking and communicating and sharing. So please come continue the interaction uh, and so we can continue the conversation. And uh, you can always give me a shout out if you want to get the newsletter at sue at constructiondreamteam.com. So thanks, everybody. Today, I'm really privileged to have our guest. He is an expert in water. Now, we know water has so much impact on our projects, whether it's a water, wastewater treatment plant, or whether it's stormwater, or whether we just have to get the water off of our site. Uh, whatever it is, water has a huge impact on our projects. And also on the politics of how development occurs, how projects can and can't happen, and just really in the whole world, because none of us can live without water, and I think we're over 80% water, so water is important to us. So today, we have Reese Tysdale. He's the president of Bluefield Research. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Reese. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Sue. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I think that's the introduction uh, I think is interesting about water. It touches everything. So I guess I'm in the thick of it now. So, but yeah, so Bluefield, I'm the president of Bluefield Research. We were founded in as a company in 2013, technically. I guess that's when we legally went for it. And uh, why did we get into this? We thought, to your point, water touches all aspe- all aspects of our lives from a business standpoint, from a personal standpoint. And so what we thought is we thought that the world or companies active in the space, whether it be supply companies, investors, uh, regulators needed more information and insights on what's happening in the water space. And so we do market research in, on water specifically. I think that's so true. And also water seems to be changing a lot too. So I want to make sure we're talking about that too. So I would just tell a little bit about uh, Bluefield Research of what I heard saw. It was founded, of course, in 2012 because water is a pressure issue for the entire generation and future generations. Uh, Think about it. I mean, a lot of the work that's happening in other parts of the world really has to do with water. Many of my friends are, uh, when they retire, going over there working to help communities have fresh water. It's a game changer for everyone. And we all heard Brian Polkinghorne talking about how he was working on water issues in the desert communities in, uh, in some of the Saudi Arabia countries where they were working to try to find water in the desert. So water is a big deal. And uh, so knowing more about it and the markets and what's happening with it, and where it's going, what the future is, uh, is really what Bluefield Research is really looking at, launching these, the company to really confront this challenge. So we are so appreciative of what you're doing and for being here as well. So tell us a little bit about what is the water market? Uh, what does it entail? And what do you see happening? What are trends that are happening? I mean, I think, is, as I mentioned, I mean, it's basically, it's the way we look at it. We break it up really four different ways in my mind, at least from a business perspective. We look at the water market. So that's water, wastewater, and stormwater more broadly. So if you think of it that way, so we're talking about all aspects, you know, supply to F, the discharge. We look at it globally uh, as one way. So that's everything outside of the U.S. and North America. And then we look at U.S. and North America. And then we also cut it another way, and that's industrial versus municipal. So they're different, different uses, but also different management and regulatory structures that are sort of managing uh, both aspects of that. So, you know, I think to your point, you're talking about friends that you know and, and peers that have worked in other markets. You know, I, having worked in El Salvador doing water projects there um, now 
seems like 25 years ago. But uh, what's interesting about it is when we got into this, we thought so much of the work would be outside of the U.S. And that's what was, you know, when we started Blue Food, we said, wow, there's all this demand and all this need for water infrastructure projects outside, just basically water supply and, and wastewater treatment. Now, having been in this for a better part of six years, there's so much demand in the U.S., basically just because of all the pipes and all the systems that are already in place. So when we, as I was talking about, you know, when we think about there's 75,000 water and wastewater systems in the U.S. There's three and a half, not quite three and a half million miles of pipe in the ground that are serving basically households and businesses in the U.S. alone. So it's pretty significant um, trying to figure out what's happening there with all this existing infrastructure that's quite honestly out of sight, out of mind for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. We hope it is out of sight and out of mind. Right. Well, <laughs> we also that's, know- a, that's, a good, that's a good thing and a bad thing. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, if, if we knew all the, if all the pipes were above ground and we saw the leaks that were happening, we'd probably say, oh my goodness, what's happening to our water infrastructure? But uh, well, yeah, exactly. Cause that brought, brought me to my idea of, I know that many of these systems are, 50 to 100 years way over their original life. Exactly. And uh, so what do you see as trends are and in, in helping with infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, I look, I, so I think to your point, some of these systems, they're old. They've got to be replaced. So it's not easy to just go in and repair a pipe that's underground. In many cases, many systems or operators, they don't even know where the pipes are they've been in there for so long, maybe the mapping is not very good. So that's one of the challenges that I think we're getting better at at understanding that companies are addressing that. I think that, you know, like I said, there's three and a half million miles of pipe. So our forecasts over the next 10 years show it's going to be upwards of uh, $15, $15 billion a year just to repair, rehabilitate, and put in new pipes in the U.S. in any given year. It's a big number, right? So I think the key is it's not like cities are flush with cash these days or utilities. So I think the other challenge is really when it comes to the infrastructure pieces, how do we rehabilitate in the U.S. our existing system or systems more efficiently? How do we do it? How do we get more out of every dollar, whether that's using trenchless technologies, whether that's using digital solutions or technologies to better understand or even predict where the failing or aging infrastructure is, um, you know, because quite honestly, some pipes are 100 years old and they're in perfectly good shape. There's some pipes that are 10 years old that are crumbling and falling apart. So having a better understanding of that. I think the other thing that is interesting to look at is sort of different material types, whether it be pipes or new solutions, whether new types of membranes, advanced treatment systems, you know, when they build new plants, they are becoming smarter in their own right. I think that's just, you know, when you get, have the opportunity to rebuild a plant, you get to start fresh. And I would say lastly, one thing that's interesting, the economy is booming, right? So everything is going swimmingly, no pun intended, and uh, is workforce management because labor is such a huge part of this. And that's one just not only understanding the network itself, but also just the labor. So you can't just dig up streets looking for the problems. You need to know, hey, where, what type of pipe is in the ground? Have we had problems there before? Is that, you know, like I said, if there's 50,000 water systems in the U.S., there's a lot of knowledge out there. But when the to my point about the economy, when the economy is going well, people start retiring. They feel comfortable in moving into retirement. I think that's a real pressing need that that is uh, becoming more apparent among utilities and municipalities. Yeah, and the aging of the baby boomers too is uh, is, yeah. is definitely uh, a trend. Demographics they know, rules, exactly. right? Yeah. yeah, and they know all about these systems, so that's the that's the challenge. So you're really talking about kind of it sounds like predictability. Like, how do we predict in a meaningful way? Uh, yeah. what, where, where we need to surgically apply the dollars we do have. Right. I mean, I think, I mean, predictive maintenance, you know, that's, we do get caught up in even a blue field. You know, we talk a lot about digital solutions or, or artificial intelligence, but there are ways that we can start figuring out 
where are we going to have problems? And that could be everything. It could be the pipes. It could be just the machinery. You know, when you're sort of, if you can track things on an ongoing basis, you don't really, things like artificial intelligence, it's not really to make, it's not to displace the workforce. It should make the workforce smarter so the workforce can do other things. I think everybody's probably sort of at their capacity and there are a lot of, a lot of opportunities to fix things. And that's where I think digital solutions can help that. Can you give us an example of where you might be thinking about or already working on some digital solutions that will be, uh, you think will be kind of maybe a little bit of a game changer? I mean, it could be even as simple as just remote monitoring a plant, right? I think a lot of companies out there, it's basically, hey, and so as things, you know, as things run, everything is fine. And when things happen, there's an event of some kind and it could be a stormwater event, right? So let's just say you're monitoring a system. And this is one of the problems with climate change is basically it, it may be warm temperatures, it may be freezing temperatures, but big storm events are wreaking havoc on wastewater systems because oftentimes all this water is just overwhelming them. So understanding what water levels are, are there, hold, are there uh, basins or even pipes in some cases for utilities to withhold wastewater or the stormwater flows, if they can hold it back until the storm passes and they can sort of start releasing the stormwater flows into the, into the treatment system or into the network, then it's a way of managing, smartly managing a system. And that can be done by remotely monitor, remotely controlled, you know, actuators and valves to, or in gates to open and close uh, water flows. That's, that'll be really important because uh, yeah. we, we all know that stuff does happen. Yes. Uh-huh. It ha- exactly. We've all been in the flooded street. So <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So what, what infrastructure needs do you, do you really see happening? What changes do you have, see, that are impacting? Okay, what is your research showing you? And I also want to know, you know, why, if I'm a utility, what would I come and ask you? What kind of research would I be looking for? Yeah, so I think part of it is the water sector is pretty conservative, right? And so the, it's and, and rightfully so on the water side, it's it's it is conservative and should be. But I would say on the wastewater side, there's I I don't want a bit more flexibility or interest in making changes. Where I would see you know on the infrastructure side, what's happening is we're lear- we're smarter than we than we ever have been. I'd like to think. But what's in it, what's happening is now we're starting to see things like algae blooms or emerging contaminants in our water supplies. We're starting to see things that are impacting our daily lives and our water supplies, and it could be drought, right? And so I think what we find is that uh, utilities are being bombarded with lots of solutions. There are, and I would, as I like to say, there are a lot of a lot of hammers running around the water industry looking for nails to, to hammer. There's smart people out there. I think the utilities, though, what they're trying to understand is what's real and what's not. What solutions have been deployed? Where have they been deployed? What was that process like? Did it work? What was the cost? And so that's what we try to do is we, we help the supply chain with answering questions like that, as well as utilities. It's basically saying, look, here are case examples. This is what the size of the market is. This is real. And sometimes we say, actually, this is not real. So I wouldn't focus on that or it hasn't been proven or tested at scale, despite what the vendor may be saying. So we lay out that land, that sort of uh, landscape for them. So really helping them to make the smarter choices, uh, maybe more proven uh, choices. Exactly. I mean, yeah, I think okay. part of, exactly. So w- that's what we do. We're always looking at it. And I, we'd like to think that everybody has a day job and they've got other things to do. And so what we do is we are a third party resource to help them out. With that. Now, I know that some of the contractors, you know, really just work in the water industry. Mm-hmm. What if someone wanted to really understand the water market how might they learn about the water markets or water markets? I'm sure there's. Water so ones. I would say two things to that. I would say one, both selfishly, 
I would say you can always go to Bluefield Research to our website. We give away free content. All you have to do is register. We provide presentations. We provide, you know, other insights. So that's where I honestly, that's where I would start. Secondly, I would say you can always reach out to me. I And the reason I say that selfishly is I'm always interested to know what people are looking for. Okay, we started the conversation about, you know, how big the water market is as a whole. Bluefield Research, we can go in so many different directions ourselves. And so but if we can zero in on what are the most pressing questions, what people are trying to understand, and that's how I help our research team sort of that's how I guide them and what directions we go cool so tell me a little bit about maybe your most insightful research you've done to date that you've kind of like wow I'm so glad I started this company because if we hadn't done this research we wouldn't have known that it made a big difference to uh, a lot of different people or to a particular segment the most insightful I would say is that's a good question i think we look at so many different things one thing that's been really interesting to me in understanding so we have technology vendors that come to us to say it could be an investor hey we have this new solution we're going to deploy it in the market tell us what that market look tell us what the u.s wastewater market looks like but the question that always comes up is well how regulated is the market and it's a bit of an a regulated but yet unregulated market. And what we've seen, we just put out a report just recently. So it's time, a good question, timely. Maybe this is recency bias, but on it's almost been almost 50 years since the Clean Water Act, right? So we're just about there. So the Cuyahoga River, you know, which was a catalyst for the Clean Water Act, that was 50 years ago when it caught on fire. And so what's interesting to see is how regulatory enforcement actions have shifted really from the federal level down to the states. And so there's been this almost just inverse trend where the, the, the federal EPA has basically stepped back and said, we'll only handle the big deals where the states, that's really where the enforcement is happening for good and bad. But not only that, so much of it is informal. A lot of these, you know, they're not a lot of uh, the, the states aren't carrying, you know, wielding sticks to get uh, the systems to, to change. Oftentimes, it's through a dialogue going back and forth. You need to fix this. You need to do that. So it's been a very like softly regulated market in, in a strange way, um, I, which I thought was was has to me is really interesting. But what I do think is happening now, we just saw our first new constituents, uh, perchlorates are now going to be regulated by the EPA. It's the first uh, addition to the list in 25 years. So it's interesting to sort of see changes happening at the regulatory level. And But it's been going on for decades, which I hadn't really thought about. That is interesting because you, would, you often think about, uh, you think that it's really highly regulated. Um, it is. I mean, on yeah. the water, because it's our drink. And I I don't want to say it's not monitored. And, you know, I would always yeah. say I feel good about my drinking water. I live in Boston. And but it's just how the regulators manage it. And uh, yeah. To some extent, you prefer them to have a dialogue over uh, dogmatic uh, actions that are required because sometimes yeah. uh, there's nuances and and things yeah. that, that happen, events that occur, and you got to deal with them as well. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And I think that that's what kind of makes it challenging as an outsider trying to get into the market, though. People are looking for, hey, if this happens, you know, if there's an algae bloom, therefore I can expect X, Y, and Z to happen. Therefore, the utility or the municipality is going to respond in X, Y, or Z ways. It doesn't always happen that yeah. way. Yeah. yeah, they may or may not, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. That's, very, that's very interesting. So tell us more about Bluefield Research and what you guys are doing exactly and you know, what, your, what, your, what your plans are to become. Yeah, so um, we do market research. And we really, what we try to do is help companies understand the market landscape, whether it be challenges in the market, whether it be oper- identifying opportunities to basically provide 
water, wastewater, stormwater management or treatment. And so it manifests in different ways. It's through off the shelf reports. We have annual sort of insight agreements where we work with clients and we do some consulting, more bespoke research for clients. It's been really exciting being doing this for the past six years. Uh, the water industry is, it is incredibly dynamic in so many respects. And so there are a lot, of, and so our, our clients could be, and sometimes they're just looking for validation just to confirm actually the PVC market for the collection networks is X size, you know, so we help them figure that out or validate it. And others, it could be, we have clients who come to us to say, we're an engineering firm and we want to understand um, what's the size of the ceramic membrane market. Can you help us figure that out? Because we think that there's going to be a change because of these different regulations or different challenges that utilities face, help us figure that out. So that's what we do. And in a nutshell, you know, we've been growing year over year and it's been exciting. And, you know, we're still not a big, big company. We just do the water industry, broadly speaking. So we are water market experts, I'd like to think. Excellent. It sounds to me too, like you had kind of a bird's eye seat to what new technologies are sort of emerging too. So what what are you seeing with that? I mean, it's interesting to see the role of advanced treatment solutions because things like now we're starting to see things like potable reuse in places like California. I mean, we have, I don't know, you know, we track across the U.S. 750, 800 wastewater reuse facilities that are being in the, in the project pipeline. And so some of these are for potable reuse. And so as a result, if it's going for potable or aquifer injection, the, the treatment systems have to be pretty advanced. They've got to make sure that it's clean. So we're starting to see that. We're starting to see the, you know, whether it be um, the digital technologies, we're starting to see that. So companies can better understand their networks because of, like I said, storm events or other leakage leakage management problems that they're facing. So, you know, on the technology side, that's really it. But like I said, it's always a challenge to sort of make for on the water side for for utilities to uh to make a leap into a new technology. It's it's an it's a, it's it's an evolution, not a revolution. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about the water side, because you've mentioned that a couple of times. Tell yeah. Me where, where you see the it sounds like ultra conservative, but you know, yeah, I'd say it's, it's, it's but. right, but they have to deliver. I mean, there are new, you know, the good thing, there are always new, there are new uh, homes being built. So a lot of, you know, pipes are tied to that. So they've got to have enough capacity on, on the water side. Another interesting aspect is the role of, you know, industry in commercial buildings. They have scale. In some cases, with water rates are rising, so water rates rose three and a half percent last year. Uh, the year before that, this is nationwide as a whole. Uh, the year before that, I think they rose. Uh, uh, I think it was a one and a half percent. So it was pretty low the year before. But what's happening is, as a whole, commercial facilities, industrial facilities, they're under bottom line pressure, right? And so what they're trying to figure out is, and the water is in seemingly in the news every day. They're starting to realize wait, we spend a lot of money on this. We're spending a lot of money, one, whether it be procuring water or we're spending a lot of money on discharging water. How can we rein this in? And how can we bring this um, closer to home so they can manage it? So in a lot of cases, we're starting to see decentralized water, wastewater treatment systems on site for these industrial facilities. And so there's a collateral impact on the municipal system Mm -hmm. because they're volume-based businesses. So if if commercial facilities and industrial facilities start to treat their own water and wastewater and become more efficient, there's a financial implication or impact on the on the utility that once again sort of squeezes the uh the water business on their end and what they're gonna do. Yeah, especially if they're all based on economies of scale. So exactly. Yeah, it's gonna be uh, challenging for them. They'll just have to get smarter. So there they need more of your smart stuff. Exactly. But it's, 
it seems to me the utilities really need to see the trends as well. They do. Not, they not do. so they're not reactive because I, that's like a death knell, right? To be reactive in this case. And there are innovative utilities. There's so many out there. Some are further along the curve, right? What I would say an innovation curve or the utility journey, as we oftentimes refer to it internally about, all right, where are they? Have they adopted smart meters just so they understand the flows across the network at every, uh, at every connection? And are they using that data? You know, how are they using the data from their SCADA systems? How are they using the, even the workforce management? Are they tracking? What exactly is happening with their uh, with their workforce in the field, and sort of using that data to understand exactly what's happening? That is that's really really so uh, important. And your work sounds uh, fun and exciting, and Im- very important for all of us because we need the water to flow, or life cannot exist. So I'm sure that you've taken a lot of projects and they haven't always gone exactly as planned. So take us back to your very worst moment on your on one of your research projects and tell us about that. Oh, good grief. You're really bringing me, taking me to task. Yeah, I mean, I think as far as, you know, the hardest thing we do is we're collecting data, we're managing data. And we try to be as true to what it tells us at any given time. You know, I think what happens is there are a lot of unknowns out there. And we have a research methodology and we try to be transparent about that and say, here's exactly how we do it. We're not ever hiding anything. But every now and then, you know, the uncomfortable part is you do a project for a client and they say, what is the size of this market? And then they challenge you on it. And look, our clients are just as smart, if not smarter than we are, right? They have a different perspective and they come at us and they come at us and they challenge us on those forecasts and they say, well, you're wrong for this reason or that reason. It's uncomfortable. Is it, uh, is it the worst moment? I mean, I guess the fact that we're having a conversation is a good thing. Um, but I, probably the worst is if I don't hear from a client, but I don't know if that's ever happened. So, uh, yeah, I would say that's really probably the biggest challenge that we face because when you're forecasting markets, they're all wrong in one way or another, right? Uh It's being able to defend them and walk someone through the logic. That's the hardest part. And that's really what we try to do is acknowledge the fact that assumptions are being made or there's only so much data available that we can work with. And then we say, here's exactly how... From step A to Z, here's how we did it. And some clients, they don't, you know, they may disagree. So hopefully, it's a it's constructive criticism as opposed to you've lost your mind. Well, I would think that sometimes the data is not showing them what they expected to see. Exactly. And so then you have misaligned expectations, and so you have to have a whole dialogue in order to get to the point where you have understanding. Right. Of what you're showing them versus what they expected. Right. So that some learning could occur, perhaps. <laughs> no, I think I think you're right. Because I do think, you know, we come at it, we're un, we I'd like to think we're unbiased, at least from the perspective of our client. They say they pose a scope or a question, say, here's what we think is happening. Can you validate? Can you tell us if this is true or not? And and sometimes what happens is someone asks that, but maybe their supervisor or their manager has a different, they get brought into the project later on. And that's when they, that's where oftentimes there could be a disconnect. The relationship with the the client may be great until others who aren't directly involved in the scoping of the project come in. But that's what we do. I mean, we're a service provider. I, I, you know, that's why we should all work service jobs at some point in our life to understand where everybody's coming from. <laughs> oh, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Or, or, or have to serve somebody in some way. Yes. Starbucks is hiring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have a great, great new rainbow frappuccino, something or other. Yeah. Nice. So, what is the very best advice that you have ever received and used? I think I would say the list is long. But I would say one thing that comes to mind, I still look at Bluefield as a startup. And I would say to anybody who is 
venturing out or on their own. But I, I think it even works for a, in a well, an established company. We all look at our peers or we even look at other industries and we look at companies and say, wow, they are so, they're wildly successful. This is incredible. Look what, I mean, a good, you know, look what, look what Amazon has done. They seem to, but I think what we, everybody fails to realize is you're in a startup and I would say that's how I feel about Bluefield. We're still at the early stages in my mind is to look at other companies, but you have to look back where they were when they started, not get enamored by where they are 10, 15, or even some cases five years later. You know, where are they? Not now, but where were they then? That's what it, we should be measuring ourselves against and looking for inspiration is how do they get from just what their core competency and really what they did. And that's what I try to do at Bluefield is sit back and say, okay, what do we do? What do we do well? Technology is not the problem. The problem is just adding value at, at its core. And so I think, you know, and sometimes that's just as basic as an Excel spreadsheet, not a fancy data visualization tool. Yeah. We could all use spreadsheets to uh, help us. <laughs> I do it, do it every day. Yes. So do you have a favorite piece of technology that you use that helps you to be more effective? I'm not, I feel like I'm telling you this just because we're recording this, but I would say it's not my phone. I, I would say it, it's, <laughs> it's within my phone. I listened, I do listen to podcasts all the time. I don't sleep at night. I listen to podcasts. I wake up at five in the morning. I listen to podcasts. I ride my bike. I listen to podcasts. I do it all the time. And part of some of it's just noise to me, like the sports. I listen to that and I just hear it. It's like, you know, waves on the ocean. Whereas then there are other informational ones like this or other ones like how I built this. Those are really interesting to me. Yeah. So I say the podcast app within my iPhone. Yeah, I, lo- I love podcasts too. I'm listening to them constantly. So we ask everybody to give us a gift. <laughs> What's a resource that you could recommend to us that would help us to maybe understand market research more, understand water more? What you got for us? I think one of the things, and I I've, I think about this periodic. I could always say go to Bluefield. You can do that. I already mentioned that. What I would say one of the more interesting books, and I think I read when I lived in El Salvador, so this is this 25 years ago, I think it was relatively new then, was the book Cadillac Desert. It's about the founding of the West and it's in water and what it means to the West and sort of how the Western U.S. has sort of grown up in a way and what the impact of what it's, I think Mark Reisner is the, is the author. It's a really good book. And that would be, I, that's what I would recommend to anybody to read. Particularly that sounds summertime, summer very reading. interesting. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. As I mentioned to you when we were talking prior, is I went on a tour of water in California, like right. in 1980. It was just fascinating, right. really fascinating stuff. So how can Construction Nation get a hold of you? So the easiest thing, I think I'm pretty easy, easily found on LinkedIn. And I and think we'll, that, we'll put yeah. a link. We'll put a link in the show notes to you. Yeah, that'd be great if you do that. And then, and just for those who are interested, I do public. Like we put out, I put out articles on LinkedIn periodically. I just put them up there, just to kind of give my thoughts on what I see, ha- perspectives about what we see happening in the market as well. And we'll also put a link to the website so everybody can jump over there too and see all the different things you have available nice. on your website nice. too. So give us some parting advice, something that we can put into action that would help us maybe understand our markets that we're going to want to work in or something that you think we could do to really be better at what we do. God, I think I don't want to sound glib, but I'll go for it. I think the one thing to think about, this is the challenge that I face and this even, I mean, I'd say outside investors. I don't think people truly understand the cost. I mean, I've got a glass of water, a bottle of water here. What is the cost of thinking about what's the cost of the glass or bottle of water in your hand? Not just what you paid at the tap. Start thinking about all the assets that go into it. You know, And I think that's one of the struggles that we all have. It's like, 
what, how many, tre- where's the treatment plant? Where are the pipes that went into it? How much, how long have the pipes been there? How long or how much maintenance do they require? What does it take to get it to my house? It's pretty incredible. And when you start thinking of it that way, then you start thinking, wow, there are all these opportunities, whether it be new materials that could go into that system. They're all, they're the, you know, how many valves go into that system, how many widgets and so on and so forth. I think that's what's kind of amazing because I think we all walk down the street thinking about whatever we do on our da- in our daily lives, but water touches every single thing from the concrete under our feet to the automobile and the washing of the car next to us to the fire hydrant as we go further down the street to the chip, you know, washing or the uh, silicon wafers and the computers in our backs. So I think it's important to understand that. It's true. It, it definitely makes us uh, makes me think about it all and uh, appreciative that we have it yeah. and appreciate that you uh, were a guest here today with us and shared about water because I really think that uh, it's an emerging market for, for us, uh, at least here in the West. But I think uh, with the global um, changes that are happening in the, in the weather patterns, uh, whether it's too much water and we have to treat it or not enough water because we have drought, uh, water is, is really an important component to this next 100 years, I think. Well, we just have to see what happens. But uh, I'm glad that there's people out there that are doing research to look at it. And, and that will spawn people to look for technologies, look for new, new methods. Years ago, I watched one of the very first pipes that had in situ form. It was like everybody thought, oh, this really? is a miracle. This, yeah. is a, this is a miracle that we don't have to dig it up and we can actually right. reline it. So more technologies, more things happening. It's going to be awesome. And we thank that you're doing this. So, okay, Construction Nation, we know more about water now and water, wastewater, stormwater. We know there's regulations. We know they're ever-changing. And, and that those people out there that have some kind of new technology, please think these things up. We need it. Come up with new ways. Use AI. Use new, new, new materials, new methodologies. It's, it really is critical. I remember working on a project not that long ago, and we needed a lot of water for a bridge that was being done fairly remotely, and it was very challenging to get enough water to pour the concrete. So uh, water is so important. It's integral to everything that we do. So please share this episode with your team. Let everybody know that uh, this is a water episode and we all need to be on top of this subject and uh, share it with everyone. I know that everyone that has come and been a guest has shared a resource. We have compiled all of those resources onto our resource page at constructiondreamteam.com slash resources. So please uh, come and get these gifts that everyone has shared. And we will put a link to the book that Reese has shared there. And you can you can grab it and see it and learn from everyone. It's uh, I just had a call the other day with someone telling me, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. it's like a crowdsourcing resource page for everyone. There's so many cool things on there. So check it out at constructiondreamteam.com slash resources. And remember that we drop every Monday morning at 4 a.m. So please join me next week when I will interview another industry leader or expert who can help you understand the people side of construction or the markets that we work in so that you can build your construction dream team. So thank you all for joining me today. And thank you, Reese, for joining me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And I will catch you next time, Construction Nation. 